Great to have you all. And I'm going to kind of go a little bit, stop, ask, take questions, whatever. And then I'm going to share a block of prayer requests on the political front. I'm going to stop and pray for that block. Um, we're probably always going to hear that whatever election is the most important one in the universe. The reality is they may be from a human perspective. A human perspective. And, uh, the midterms, if we get an honest election, is an important one. I, 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 if, if there's not a change to the tide that we're seeing, we're involved in the last two weeks is amazing skin. I don't know if there will be much left economically, whatever, uh, in, in two more years. So you, know, you watch your 401s, whatever investment arms, if you have any. So what kind of hit did you get on the last quarterly report? What kind of hit did you get? That was a big hit for me. If you're in it, it was only 8%. <laughs> Some of us more. <laughs> so you can be hit. So um, here's here's an example of choice boss hoping for a favorable election result that will give investors confidence to invest in and in advance their companies and ask for these contracts or ask for work that you that you provide. And if there's not that kind of confidence uh, after the elections, then you're gonna have a further tailspin, likely. Uh, with the economy, and um, and who knows what that stock market will be? It, it could be jolting, jolting. So we're not praying for the election to be well, so we our, our pocketbooks are safer. You know, that's we can see both the pocketbooks, but uh, that's just one ramification of uh, the morality. Uh, the one state party I preached on on Sunday is a reality. They want total control, and they don't want to let go. They don't care what they have to do. And that's scary. That's really scary. Who can stop it? Uh, you have all of your DOJ departments weaponized and, and topped out with your guys. It's, it's, we're at a, I think, a very fragile point here. So, anyway, we want to pray for certain parts of this election next week. I'll share some of those with you. Uh, but I do want to start uh, first with just some theology. It's great that Brother Seven with me. He can tag team on some of these points. Well, there is one way of hope. Yeah. Not for us directly, but uh, Netanyahu might like to sit back in power here in Israel. That would be something. <laughs> that would not for us, but yeah, but for Israel, perhaps, yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. something right yet, but it's going to be Yeah. And in Israel's their, their government processes are extremely complicated. It's extremely complicated. But yeah. <clears throat> I think about this country and would take whatever preemptive measures to make sure it stands, regardless of what the world does. Who does? He seems to be that kind of man. Um, what I was trying to share a little bit in my introduction is each of us, we, we come to the Bible and you read it and you try to relate parts of it and sequence of it, chronology of it. We try to put together, a, you know, how does this all go together? How, how do I interpret all this? And uh, that process is, is challenging. It's been in the man's you know, Christian's efforts throughout millennia. It's how to organize the Bible, how to consistently group it, how to thematically put together and um, even put together approaches. And often those are called systems. A systematic approach or a theological approach and what does this look like and um, I, I will share with people that I'm dispensational dispensational in my way I organize the Bible in my mind my mind that uh, there are distinctions that God has made that he's doing something with Israel and he has a program in place for Israel and right now we're in the church age and on the most part, there's a spiritual blindness for Israel. But the story doesn't end there. There's going to be a day in which those eyes are open. You'll see the one that they crucified. And there'll be a, the blood will be available from the fountain. Filled with the men who's blood. And there'll be a day in which Israel will turn to the Lord. And there'll be a tremendous um, return to Christ. They will finally accept him as Messiah. And uh, he will come and literally reign, literally reign thousand year time period and uh, that was the view uh, whether it was right or not historically you know, the historic interpretation of the bible the first three centuries especially after christ's life 
viewed a, a the future that the king would come back and have a neutral earthly kingdom. In a, in a Roman Empire, that position was a Chiliast position, which is simply meaning that we're for a thousand. We call it Billy and millennium, you know, a thousand year reign of Christ. And uh, that, that was the view. That was the view. A very, very dominant view in the early church fathers and writings. It's just probably hands down. Whether you hold that view or not, it's historically as what they uh, Things are going to change with Augustine. Augustine is brilliant. It's like he runs two systems in his mind. It's like he runs Mac, a Mac hardware, or PC hardware. He runs like two operational systems. So you, you read you read Augustine, and sometimes you say, this guy is absolutely spot on, right down the line theologically. And he's got this organized. And then there's other times you read, and you say, this guy is as Catholic as can be. He's like, he's like two men inside one uh, with his theological systems. So he... He, he's studying the word and he's trying to, you know, likewise organize how this works and relates the Old Testament, the New Testament, the future things. And he comes up with an idea that that 1,000 years is not literal. It's just not literal. And it violates hermeneutical principles. Um, where you should interpret those cardinal numbers as standalone what they mean numbers. Literally 1,000 years or literally how many days or literally whatever. And um, he says, no, there won't be a millennium. Ah, no, there'll be no millennium. And that Christ right, uh, the Satan right now is bound. And right now the kingdom is in play. And he, he, he writes this in, uh, in, in a book that's quite popular, you know, for books in that era, you know, in the fourth century, uh, called The City of God. And it's his, his statement regarding the millennium and the rule of God. I understood the Bible. And uh, that that position became extremely popular. You know, it, 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 it was a position that the church at Rome is going to adopt. And all roads are leading to Rome. There's there's councils in different locations around the world that resolve theological issues, questions, debates. But it seems like Rome more and more is the headquarters. It's the capital. The roads lead there. And that church in Rome just seems to get more and more powerful. It seems that initially they had the orthodox answers. And so all of a sudden, um, the, the theologues basically jump on Augustine's no millennial position. And they run with it. And they promote it. And it becomes the official position in due time of the Roman Catholic Church. So um, now you got a real problem. A real problem. Because you, you have... In the Old Testament, promises are given to a, na a nation that are literal, physical, national, regarding a people and a plan that God has for that people. And those verses now cannot refer to the millennium as they were designed to refer to. So now the interpreter has to take those verses and allegorize them. And you had some very popular speakers who were good at allegorizing, or origin apparently was phenomenally intriguing, theologically crazy. These ideas were off the chart with wild interpretations, very subjective, very creative. But what happened is now you're taking these verses and you, you just, it's a very, it's just your guess is as good as mine type of thing on so much of the scripture. And if you deny the literal interpretation, you deny the distinction between Israel and the church, and you allegorize all the promises to Israel, and fine. That's, that's, that's hundreds. Those are probably thousands of verses. By implication, thousands. So if you're an amillennialist, you're off on your interpretation with thousands of verses. Okay. You know, I don't want to be off on one. I, I know I must be, but because we're all very human. But I don't want to be off on any, but to be to, to have a system that immediately dumps you into it, false interpretations in, in hundreds and hundreds of verses. And I don't I want to be part of it. So amillennialism kind of took the day. And then, um, you know, you have this mono ecclesiastical monopoly called Rome. And you have uh, a very interesting government situation developing of Rome and the empire. They're in cahoots together. Okay. So as we watch the church age unfold, the first century was brutal. You can't build a church building. It's hard to start a church without being persecuted. It's illegal to be a Christian. That's first century. And the Jews are hammering. They hate this new sect which was 
most largely Jews from the beginning. So, so the early church is getting hammered by Jews, and then the Romans are piling on too. Then you get into the second century, it's still legal to be a Christian. So from a governmental viewpoint, uh, you're just surviving. You're just trying to stay alive until Constantine gives a tolerance, of a edict of tolerance, and then makes it permittable to be a Christian about Roman consequences. 313, 311, 313. And so now, from a governmental viewpoint, the relationship with the government in the first three centuries, you're just hiding from the bombs. That's your relationship with government. You're trying to be a good citizen, but they're not making it easy. Okay, for these crazy Romans, and these emperors. Now, you're, now your relationship with government in the, in the fourth century, the 300s, it's, it's really weird. It's really weird because by the end of the fourth century, 390, you now have a new Roman emperor who's saying you must be a Christian to be a Roman citizen. So it's going from it's illegal to now you must be one. So you think of the ramifications of that. Mass conversions outwardly to be a obedient Roman citizen. Take the name of Jesus along about a conversion. So now, now the church is taking on the world. Okay, and then the floodgates have been open, and, and the world is just filling the churches. Now it's legal to be a Christian. But man, you're just being infiltrated by a Roman empire. So your church looks like a Roman empire. So now we get into <clears throat> the 400s and then <clears throat> later 500s, and you have, you know, this Roman monopoly really taking hold. In 590, Gregory the Great, man, he just locks it down. This is what it's going to be. This is, I'm called of God, I'm the representative of God on earth. This is how we're going to do life in church. And they're in daring to who? So the government's a one state church in essence. So they were basically one and the same, and they're partners. And there's tension because who's more important, the emperor or the pope? Or the pope? And it will vary at what time period you look at as to who had the upper hand, who was the more dominant personality. And so there's this constant tension, constant tension. That lasts a thousand years. <clears throat> so if, if you're a church guy, during that thousand years, your relationship to, to, to the government is man. It's a, they got a monopoly on both the boards, the religious board and the, and the plank of the government. I'm just totally under. And uh, you're in a really rough situation. So you have a state church, and Satan's having a heyday because through that system, he's oppressing the truth, oppressing the truth, pushing the truth away. And so people are being born, they live, they die, they go to hell. They live, they're born, they live, they die. So it's terrible. And yes, there's a pockets of some people figuring it out and, and, and they're getting they're getting some truth and there are people saved and, and God keeps us running and going, praise God for that. But it's not pretty. It's not pretty. We come to the Reformation. Luther, very strong personality. Leo the Tenth is a loser. He is, he is useless as a pope. He's useless. He doesn't understand theology. He doesn't know the implications of what Luther's arguing for. He, he got in. He got into the office through a deal, a monetary transaction. He's a lost man. He's just a lost man. But he's getting counsel. And the counsel is this guy. This guy's trouble. This guy's trouble. And fortunately for Luther, he had some Roman political parties leaders that kind of insulated him some. So it was just the perfect storm for Rome to lose the monopoly. And uh, we get a breakthrough, we get a breakthrough. And Luther, of course, you know, he's so thankful for how, you know, what he did accomplish, what we read, how, you know, wish he would have gone more, would we have gone further in, in those settings? You know, good luck, who knows? Uh, the, the Lutherans weren't very, very friendly to the, the next wave of the Reformation. So they would persecute, just like Rome, people like the Anabaptists and others, they were pretty rough. So what's happening is, you have the state church and the monopolies being broken up, and you have these Christians coming in out of this Reformation culture, and they're trying to figure out everything. And they're trying to figure out, number one, salvation. And they're getting it. Salvation by faith alone, justification through faith. You know, the sola scriptura. They're, they're getting these key truths and rediscovering of great things. And not the last thing I got in their mind was eschatology, but there was other, there was other issues so much... Uh, does this pertain to survival, you know, and new start? And so what basically happens from Reformation to the current day, you have these little ways of progression of 
revelation in the sense of studying the theology and doing these doctrines. And you, you come into the 1800s, you start to have this rediscovery of, of, of millennial thought. Millennial thought. And there's a little bit in the 1700s, there's little tidbits here and there. The 1800s, now you're getting some people saying, hey, what, what about this 1,000 year rain deal? And as, as they started to look at the scriptures, they're realizing Augustine has had his way for a long time on this in the millennium. And so now you're getting some millennial thought going. You start to have people within the church saying, I'm tired of this church of England. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of, you know, just trying to purify the thing with linen. It's not working. Someone's separating. And those separatists paid a price. They paid a price to come out of that church and say, look, I'm just tired of it. It's not working. We're going to do our own thing. And uh, that did not go well. That did not go well to, to break away from, from the state church. And persecution fell on, on those folks over the 1600s. And those people would flee to, to Holland. And they would go there. And Holland was a great, safe, safe place for them. But Holland was worldly. They'll tell you in their writings, we just don't like it. They're just worldly. We don't want our kids to be worldly like the people in Holland. And so they were there, thankful to be alive. But man, as soon as they could get out of town, they're going to the new world. And what happens, they come to a new world. And finally, they think they have freedom of religion. And basically, they recreate the same structure that they just fled from. So if you study those colonial days, what they're doing, they're basically going back to England. That's all they know. The congregational thought and, and basically creating a, a, an American English church. And, um, and falling into the same pitfalls and the same traps, things you thought they would have learned it. And then this process gets interrupted with a with a war. And people are sick of England with the taxation issues, they're sick of paying the government taxes, state church taxes, and other issues. And the thing escalates. And the pastors are trying to slow it down. The colonial pastors say, no, we don't need to go to war. Let's that, let's try to as long as we can be submissive. Let's pray for these authorities. Let's not do it. Let's not do it. Let's not do it. And finally, after about 10 years of that going on, the pastor says, forget it. You got to, we're going to war. When the pastor said we're going to war, they went to war. And at that point, there was there was a revolt, a revolution. And uh, we, 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 we uh, the benefactors of it, the, the colonialists win. They shouldn't have won against England. Are you kidding? But there was something about that group of people. And in the providence of God, you study the stories of Washington and other leaders, how God just, just providentially, graciously blessed the founding of this nation, just miraculously. So we get into a, a new world, a new government. We have an unbelievable constitution that's formed. And uh, we're, we're, we're moving into the 1780s. Things are going forward. And yet there's a, a little bit of buyer's remorse with some of the pastors, Baptists in particular, saying, you know, this is great. We have our freedom, but I don't see in our document enough insulation to protect us from going back to the state church. So uh, John Leland in particular and others like him basically said, uh, I think we need to add something, an amendment. You, know, you write something, you don't have an amendment. They come later, you amend. And uh, Leland, you know, really argued, we need this. We need this, this protection. We need it to make it clear that there's a separation between the church and state. That doesn't mean you can't have God in government. It doesn't mean you can't pray and have commandments. We just don't want a state church. That's what it was all about. We don't want a state church. We want to make it very clear, build a wall there. And uh, Madison, uh, one of the architects of the Constitution, was, you know, Leland begged him to, to add it. You have the influence. You have the, you have the processes. You can do this. And uh, Madison, after deliberation and then a deal with Leland, where Leland was going to run for public office, said, you know what? You know what? what if I drop out of the race? I'm, le I'm leading the polls, technically. I'm going to win this thing. You know I am, James. Why don't I bow out of the race if you would do this? If you would, would just please take this opportunity to write that amendment. And Madison agreed to it. Leland drops out. Madison wins. Madison does the first thing. So that was one of the most important things in that document. There's many important parts of our Constitution. That First Amendment is critical. And what we've been watching over recent years, and, and I think there's been seeds going for many years, but in recent years is an erosion of that amendment where, where the government really wants to control everything. And they want to be a one-party 
in control state church, state government, and to weaponize everything in their hands uh, to, to really go after people who oppose them, theologically, politically, whatever. And that may sound radical, but it sounded really radical 20 years ago. I don't think it sounds so radical today. But I think that's what we are. I think there's, I think there's a, this pocket of some really evil people, really evil people. And so what I was trying to share on Sunday um, was, folks, what is our human responsibility for government? And what is our responsibility? I'm going to pick that study up, which I didn't study, go over on Sunday. I'm going to pick that in the morning. But uh, what is our responsibility? Because at the end of the day, we, we must do life as God told the church to do. And there are certain guiding principles that are taught about five passages I'm going to cover. But uh, I, I give this rambling history to tell you, we, we, we as a country, when you study all of church history and government, almost all of it is a state-controlled church. Okay? And for Satan, that worked really well. And I think when you come to the tribulation, you have a one world system with two, two, two departments, a political leader and a religious leader, and they're working together. And it's a really weird relationship. The government's using the church for its purposes and then devours the religious block later when it makes it more purpose. So it's really disingenuous, but let's say it's disingenuous. So um, we know where it's all going. Here we are probably at the end of the age. We're probably those dangling believers. I'm hoping just as the Lord's coming in our lifetime, we, we could be that last little group. And what do we do with the days God has given us to stand in this gap? What do we do to, to please God and make them have the most impact uh, with the people? So um, we want to get to those type of questions. But first, any comments on just this overview? I kind of my sermon sharing some of that now. Comments or questions. So the thousand years, you know, that's coming on from Augustine's timing. But did it get just mushed all into the allegory? And it, 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 <laughs> a thousand's a random number. It doesn't really mean a thousand. So a thousand's a thousand. Right? That that they don't take it long. Long time. It's a long time. Yeah. Long, long, long time. Yeah. Hi, big John. So so yeah. Yes, so, we're just starting. Let's begin now, man. <laughs> so the millennium is important because um, for me, Christ is going to reign. And he's going to show us what man should have been doing. We're going to finally see it done right by the, by the King of Kings. We were, we were to, to do this. Was, we were given this responsibility to subdue and govern it. And we've not done a very good job. Okay. So Sam. How many times have I heard so we're, where we're at because the church has been silent. The church didn't do the job. But at what point do you do stand up and do your job? You know, I I didn't get to hear your sermon Sunday. I had to learn scientific opinions. But yeah. um, Mark was telling me about it today. Our prayer was okay. Me. We uh, had a real problem with your sermon. Yeah, I probably did. <laughs> but uh, you know, at the end, you said, pray for these folks. And he says, the only prayer I have for them is an imprecatory prayer. I, you know, they're the enemy. Um, and we need to stand up against them. So we'll, we'll come to that. But that's, I'll answer up some verses. Brother Bud. Yeah, I think there's a, a little bit of history that I would just add going back before Constant, before uh, Augustine. Uh, Augustine did not invent the uh, allegorical approach. Uh, he picked it up probably from a couple of Jewish guys who lived 100 years before Christ. Their names were Aristobulus and Philo. Uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, there was a large Jewish colony and, and a great learning center there. And these two guys, Aristobulus was the older of the two. Philo was kind of his disciple. They came up with the idea that they needed to synthesize Judaism with Greek philosophy and that the only way they could synthesize God's people with the world's people was to take an allegorical approach to the scriptures. And they did that. And so uh, Judaism became corrupted through Hellenism. And really, we know them in the New Testament as the Sadducees, which were the byproduct of, of Aristobulus and Philo synthesizing 
Old Testament Judaism with, with, with Aristotle and Plato. So, you know, the idea that, that you, you synthesize biblical teaching with what the world says, uh, you know, uh, that was picked up by Augustine because the world was gaining power. It was becoming a Roman Christian element, and it gave the power to what would become the Roman Catholic Church. So today we're facing the same battle, uh, you know, that, that we're, to, we're to compromise God's truth with the world. It's the cultural compromise. And so all of those things really haven't changed over the centuries. And back to the, to the New England days, uh, there's a really good book by David Beale called The Mayflower Pilgrims. And he traces the 100-year descent of the uh, pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock from 100 years from their landing to becoming Unitarian. Christ deniers. And he traces that. And it's the same thing. It's, it's compromising the clear teaching, the word of God for the purpose of, of uh, the control of the world, state, state church. And uh, it's the degeneration from, from belief to control. And so I think your sermon Sunday was absolutely 100% on track. Uh, you know, how soon we will have a one party U.S. situation, you know, nobody knows, but, uh, uh, the handwriting is on the wall. So I'll come and cover those questions at the same time. Thank you, brother. Those are excellent. Questions. There's a lot of pieces to what we just all that all this book. There's a lot of pieces, obviously. So if you're a Muslim and you, their goal, if you're especially Shiite, your goal is to conquer the world. What is part of their philosophy to do that? What's, how, are they, how are they accomplishing that? Believe or die. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty simple. All right. So the message is pretty clear. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. What's another way they, they conquer? Have a lot of kids. They have a lot of kids. <clears throat> Catholics have a lot of kids. Historically. So Muslims have a lot of kids. What else do they do? Are they part of their strategy? Well, aren't they? They're anti Christ, so they're going to take out, try to take out the Christians. They can. Can they break Sharia law? Sure, she has to. So that's very important. They're not law, they have a standard. So they have a lot of kids, they have a standard. They have a goal, clear mission is the world. Okay. What else do they have? It's, it, it, it seems to be advancing their cause. Money. Money, okay, they, they're, 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 they use their monies in this mission. Even your giving going to a Shiite mosque goes to arming your, your soldiers in the jihads. Fear. Okay, they have a fear or intimidating. Okay. Both the Catholics and the Muslims have historically used uh, the sword uh, to conquer and bring about the belief rather than, uh, you know, the word and influence. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of fear, the, the military flavors. They're also, at least the Muslims, are very, very, very patient. The communists, in some cases, are very, very patient. And um, their strategy is what? Like, let's go to China. What, is, what's, what are they doing right now? What have they been doing? How, how do they conquer their long game? What's their long game look like? Well, the population is growing. Even with their one child policy, they, they still have a you know, one point, whatever, four billion, whatever it is. Yeah. It's my kids. Okay. They're buying up all our farm land. Strategic purchases. They're wise with money. Again, another wise purchases, strategic purchases. Let's show this off. Assimilation. Assimilation. Assimilation, migration, immigration. Education. So, you know, the, the children of light sometimes are pretty ignorant, pretty dense. You know, don't learn much from children of darkness. You know, I think of that example of that parable that Jesus taught. The unjust steward, remember how that goes? Basically, he says, man, you, you, you know, I'm teaching you something. This guy that paved a future with, you know, hedging his bills with the, you know, his creditors, knowing that he was on the way out, he, he was a pretty sharp guy. He's shrewd, shrewd. You know, evil, unethical, and godly, but he's shrewd. He's a really smart thing about the future plans. And what's the Lord? How's the Lord spin that thing to then to apply it to life for us? What's He do there? How's He apply that parable 
of the unjust steward. First, the thought from most of chapter and verse. You make, make friends of mammon so that when they fail, they'll receive you know, everlasting habitations. Yeah, that we can learn some wisdom from some of these. So can we use the sword? Is that is that our option? Does the church advance with the sword like with the Muslims and the Crusaders? That's not an option. Jesus told us, you don't use the sword. The church does not use the sword. Mm -hmm. but we're not going to do that. So that's that's clearly a mandate. In my mind, that's pretty clear. You don't, you don't advance the kingdom of God by the sword. The church. Uh, the patience, the training, the teaching. <laughs> the <laughs> that's, 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 that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. I, I think if the church was doing its job of making disciples and training and equipping people with the right to the world view, do you think we'd have the type of voting? Um, not just the turnout, but how people vote. If people had a truly biblical worldview, so how many Christians this election term won't vote, or how many Christians will vote for some abortions? That's what irritates me. I mean, how? Yeah. Well, that was can your world Christian worldview doesn't. Well, that was the question that everyone asked me the other day as we were calling out the ballots. So, Republican or pro life? She did, but the you know, I mean, the first year of Trump's election, you know, we voted third party because, yeah, either you vote for the person that stands for your values, or I mean, you know, the comment is, well, you just waste on your vote. Well, you know, people didn't think that way. So I think the gospel is the key. If people really get saved and internal, and they're taught a biblical worldview, that's going to change everything. That's a long haul. And we like we like short answers. We want quick fixes, and uh, that's gotten us nowhere. You know, you, the pragmatic church today. What does what's the church want today? How how's most churches operate? What difference? It's, it's manipulative. It's controls. It's pragmatic. It's worldly. It's a quick fix, but, but true biblical discipleship is line upon line. It's a little by little. It's time building, building it. God and how many agree, agree with the enemy, agree with the enemy, agree with the enemy. Yeah. I've got all these people. Right? Well, a lot of, of them. Yeah. None of them can see the devil in the Well, there's a there's a spiritual thing. So. What I'd like to share with you, I'm going to share a couple of Bible verses, and then I'm going to take a block of some, some things to pray for, and we'll pray for that, and then we'll hit a few more verses to pray for the group. So um, what I didn't get to on Sunday, um, I'd like to hit, is first on the matter of prayer. Let's start with prayer. Okay. And Sam, you weren't at, in the service. So what I shared was in the first century of the church, these were the emperors and leaders of the world. Let me give you just a okay, so, so here's the here's the first century. From the time of Christ's birth to the death of the Apostle John. So anything written in the New Testament about our responsibility to government, one of these guys were in office, and really just a few of them were in office. And the, the books were actually written. So uh, Caesar Augustus is uh, is the emperor when Christ is born. Tiberius Caesar is the emperor uh, through most of Christ's ministry and, and through the alphabet also his death. But the under Tiberius where the church was born, 30 AD. Uh, Caligula will take it over from Tiberius. Caligula's nickname Mad Caligula. Crazy, paranoid, sicko. Makes his force the mayor of Rome. I mean, that guy's crazy, that guy's crazy. Then you have uh, Claudius that takes his place. Claudius is, you know, really helps the gospel out. And Bertley, he has Britain to the Roman Empire. Paul says, man, that's great, let's go. And uh, he's, he's the one who sent the Jews out of Rome. Okay. That was a problem. And Jews probably also meant Christians. He lumped them together in his mind. So the first real wave of persecution, a deadly, deadly, deadly wave is Nero. 
And Nero starts off very solid as a, as a political leader. He got a lot of projects done. And they, they, the historians say something happened where he snapped. He's lost it. He's lost it. And he goes on a killing spree. Uh, and he kills his, his wife, his brother, his mother, his advisor, later Paul. He's the one who burns down the city of Rome. He's the one who blames it on the Christians. He's the one who tortures Christians. I mean, he's, he's next. And he's reigning from 54 to 68 AD. So most of the epistles are written in that time period. So when, when Paul talks about government officials, it's Nero. It's Nero. Not Joe Biden. It's Nero. Okay. And then you have you have Galba, Otho, and Natalius, basically all one one termers, actually one years. They go in office, they get assassinated. If another guy goes in, he's assassinated. They all, they all just live in the heat. You have Nitellius, again, disaster one year. And then you have Flavius and Aspatian. This is a whole new dynasty. And he comes in and uh, he's serious. He, he takes his job quite seriously. And when it comes to controlling Israel, the temple's a problem. And, and he works with Josephus, he works with other Jews trying to say, look, you need to tell your people to chill out, the workers are going to crush them. Yeah. Josephus goes back and forth trying to do willing dealing and, and, and others. And uh, finally, the, the Jews are just kind of redneck saying, look, we can take Rome land. At this time, no one takes Rome. Really bad idea. So uh, Flavius' son Titus comes to Jerusalem, surrounds the city for three and a half years, nearly three and a half years. Chokes the life out of it, and then uh, his men are up there on the on the Mount of Olives, just looking down, licking their chops. And one and one young buck got a little anxious and shot a firebrand in, started a fire, it got pretty hot, and got into the temple area where the gold and the, the parts of the temple was, was there, and melted the gold. And the, the gold started to stream down the cracks of the blocks of the, the road. And, and no one could stop the boys. Once they saw the gold, it was just crazy. And they went in there, those soldiers, and took every rock from the temple down to extract the gold. Not one stone left upon another. Not one stone left upon another. They had no idea they were fulfilling Jesus' prophecy. No idea. And Titus watches this. Titus, this is going to be a big victory for Titus. Daddy is very, very proud of this. He's going to bring back some really neat artifacts to the city of Rome. And probably some of you have seen those artifacts in Rome. Have you seen them right there? With the, yes. With, with, tell, tell me what you see when you get in. Well, the, uh, it's depicted in the uh, Arc de Triumph uh, coming into uh, the city. And you've got the candelabra, you've got the uh, Jewish vessels, you've got, uh, you've got Jewish leaders enslaved. Uh, it's, uh, it's really quite. Uh, yeah, it'll propel him to being Caesar. Oh, he's the man. He, he, and uh, he, they, they're selective with their slaves that they bring in. The guys they bring in, they're all Arnold Schwarzeneggers. Okay, if you're a puny slave, you leave that guy behind. You want to bring in the biggest, baddest dudes the Jews had. So when they come in, your citizens are saying, well, those are some good guys. Look at the linemen. And our guys took them down. It was very, very impressive. Okay. And uh, it was commemorated. And so Titus becomes the next Caesar, not, not for long. And then you have Domitian. And Domitian um, is going to be the ruling empire with emperor with, with, with the timeline of the end of John's life. He's the one that exiles John. Okay. These are the guys. These are the guys. When you read the New Testament, you can't say, well, you know, today our rulers are much wicked or Find one that's worse than Domitian. Study his life. If you have one that's better, worse than Domitian, run him. Okay. Or Nero. Right? We have some bad actors, but these are really bad. Okay. They're really bad. Okay. So here's what here's what Paul says when Nero is in charge and who's going to take his life like this. And I love what he says here. And this this isn't time, you know, this isn't okay. You only do this when you feel like it, or you only do this under certain circumstances, or if there is or if there's good kings, whatever. He says, I exhort therefore, first Timothy 2 2. But first of all, here's your priority as Christians when it comes to government. Priority. First of all, 
supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. So four, you know, four slightly different terms describe this intense mandate from God through Paul's pen to do something, first of all. And that is to, to, to pray for all men. All men, all classes of men, all men, all men. And then he gives you the specifics for kings, for kings. Because, well, I believe you don't have a king. You're right, you don't have a king. You're a I think that would fit under you know, either a nation or a country. So pray for kings. Give thanks for kings. Intercede for kings. And for all that are in authority, all that are in authority. And some of those emperors I listed, they were in office because they stole the office. Some are in the office because they bought the office. Some are in the office because they assassinated the guy before in the office. So the argument often is said, well, we can't. These are the illegitimate leaders in our country. No, God is sovereign. He put them in. He put them in. Like it or not, he put them in. Just as he put these guys there for a century. So pray for all them that are in authority. And then he tells you why you do this. He tells you why you do this. That we as believers may lead a, a, a quiet and peaceable life in this type of lifestyle, in all godliness and honesty. You know, I, I would like to have a peaceful, peaceful, quiet life. I, I don't want to get stirred up all the time. I don't want to be angry all the time. I don't want to be frustrated all the time. I don't want to be in war with these people all the time. I, I would like this, 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 this climate that's being described there. And then he says, to do this first of all, this praying for those on political positions, and all men, but these political leaders, this is good. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And the word acceptable there means this, it, it pleases God to be this kind of Christian. This pleases God. He's telling you what pleases God. And what I like about these New Testament passages on government, you have these very challenging requests when you put it into the first century context and our current context. But he always brings it around to a salvific theme. Okay, so the next verse, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Every time he gives a political mandate, on the heels of it, is something about Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world who wants to save souls. It comes right back to the mission. So he's saying to you as Christians, you pray and say, I don't even know how to pray. When you pray for them to get saved, this is, you know, he, he doesn't have find pleasure in the death of the wicked. And he wishes all would come to repentance. I can at least pray for that for these people. I don't want to go to hell. That's, that's really bad thinking. Okay. God finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't. Nor should we. So, so I don't know any other way to explain this passage other than what I just did. It. I think the responsibility to pray for our president, to pray for our vice president. To, to pray for our Speaker of the House, to, to pray for whoever, 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 for our, 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 our governor here in Colorado. And if I understand the passage wrong, I'm disobedient if I don't pray for him. And if we're looking for a peaceful and good life here, even with some bad actors, and we don't get it, maybe it's because we've not been praying. I think that's part of it. And then why don't we see more people say when, when Paul writes in prison, it's always neat that he drops these little names. And as you kind of read some of those names, you're saying, did I read that right? That sounds like someone in a political position getting saved. That sounds like one of the workers there in the government being saved. And wow, this is awesome. They, they have souls too. And so um, I think this is our obligation. So now, we're in a unique situation. We're in a constitutional republic. Wow, we, we have a de democratic process. We can vote for a lot of this. And we, historically, we've hoped for an honest election. If we lose, we can take our, our licks. But if it's cheated, that really bugs us, right? I, that gets you ticked off. But uh, my first block here to pray for, to share this, you know, in my mind, humanly speaking, our responsibility is to pray for our leaders, I think that would extend to praying for an election. If you're in a country like ours, that has an election, good night. We should pray. We should, we should, you know, pray for leaders, future leaders, election turnout, election results. <clears throat> so in my mind, and, I, and again, I'm just telling you, God puts people in positions either to bless us or probably 
case of suit for motion or the other. But we have 435 House seats at the national level. Currently, 220 of those seats are Democrats, and they vote by in a block form. We have uh, 212 Republicans, 213, for example. People die because of the So what this means is for the House to turn red and more conservatively, conservatively bent and possibly a thorn in the current administration's downward pull, we need 218 for majority, 218. People that have some some courage, some ethics, some Americanism, whatever morals. Thank you. So um, we have we have a we have a lot of races. We have four hundred thirty-five. It's a lot. There's a lot of numbers there. We have our eighth district here. So they say it's a very close race right now. Derek Caravia, the Democrat, running against Barbara Bergman. He says it's a very close race. In our state, most of our House people. This is a very blue state right now. It's a very blue state. I came here in 02, it was a red state. And then it became a purple state. When marijuana was put on the ballot, it became a, it became a blue state. So, so we, we need to pray for our own state, okay? Uh, we have a girl that was in our church just a couple weeks ago. This is Demont, she was running for a house position in the state. Will she win? I don't know, she is a believer. Dave's on the city council here in West Minster. are good people. I like the special Mrs. Devon. I'd like to pray for Barb Kirkmeyer in this case with the house. But um, right now, again, under normal, if things are done legally and properly, there's it's favorable right now. But in the world we live in, what does that mean? You know, let's pray for the house to be turned. Let's pray. I think that's where we stand in the gap and pray. Uh, when it comes to the Senate, we have two from each state. There are 35 Senate seats up for grabs right now. 35. There's 48 Democrats, two independents, and 50 Republicans. It's 50 50. Occasionally, Mansion, uh, occasionally, uh, whatever Kirsten's last name is, uh, they occasionally vote on the Democratic Party. But it's 50 50. 50 50. What's that mean? That means a vice president votes to make the difference. Okay. So this is really tight. Uh, right now, there are 10 races that are extremely tight, extremely tight. And uh, we, we need to pray that, that God will give us, if it be his will, that he will give us a victory here, even to turn the Senate over. Then I think we can we can put, put this horrible, evil uh, agenda, at least slow it down, slow it down. It's not, it's not going to save our souls, but I think this is where Saul and Mike does have an impact. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. You know, I think our, our praying can make a difference. Uh, I like to pray for the House and for the Senate elections. Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I've, I've watched things there with great interest. And watch John Fetterman. That really bothers me. He's incompetent. Uh, he's not in a position to run a Senate. He's running against uh, Mayman Oz. Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz, he's a Muslim. Dr. Oz is? Oh my. So he's a Republican Muslim. If he's elected as a senator from Pennsylvania, he'll be the first Muslim American in the history of the U.S. Senate. Oh no, there's still a choice, but I'm just telling you. I'm just saying, you have a very interesting race there, okay? Warnock and Walker, I don't know all Walker's personal details. The guy's been smeared, whether it's legit or not, I don't, I don't know. Um, you can study the two guys out. I can't imagine. Uh, anyway, let's pray for that race. But, you know, Pastor, they're from Pennsylvania, so I mean, is anything good coming from Pennsylvania? Not that I know. Ron Johnson, Wisconsin, close election. J.D. Vance, Ohio, young buck, going up against Tim Ryan. Really tough race. Adam Laxalt, Nevada. Marco Rubio, can't count on everything, anything. Uh, Blake Masters, another young guy down in Arizona. He's surprising us. In our own state, we have a very unique situation with Joe O'Day. That's, a, that's the Republican. Joe's got big problems. Okay? He doesn't have as many problems as Michael Bennett, but his problems. 
So this is where you get in these conundrums. Well, who do you vote for? What do you do when you have the lesser? You hate voting for the lesser two evil. What do you do? That's your conscience. You gotta make do your homework and pick if this is center race. Um, Bulldog in New Hampshire. Would that be crazy? And uh, Ted Budd in North Carolina, not being covered in that race. That's pretty close. So uh, why don't we get someone to volunteer to pray for the House for next week's elections and then someone to pray for the Senate. So we have a volunteer to pray for the House. The Lord's will be done for Troy and for the Senate. So we pray for our existing leaders too, like the Senator Kennedy? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to conclude with that. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. I thought it was a passage. So, well, we'll pray in blocks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what poor Mark Slater about fell out of the seat is I went to this passage from Prayer Sam. I said, now I'm going to really test you. The next slide was our president, our vice president, our speaker, and they're all standing up. Poor Mark, though. I thought he was going to die. We need to pray for those in the office. All right. So, Troy. And that better be Lord, um, we thank you for this time of prayer. We thank you for the reminder from Scripture on how to be biblically centered. Lord, while it's difficult in our carnal selves to put away the sword, we realize that <coughs> with your coming and with your uh, death on the cross and resurrection, Lord, and the founding of the church, Lord, you brought in a new covenant. And uh, help us to understand the transition. And while we're on the other side of the book of Acts and Pentecost and so forth, Lord, that we're, we're not in that transition zone, Lord. We're clearly on, on this side of, of uh, your coming and your instructions to us and, and the writings from Paul uh, inspired by you. Uh, Lord, it is convicting as we, we look around and struggle to find um, statesmen and holy men and women, Lord, to fill the offices of our yes. government. And uh, Lord, we we may not do any better with the pressures that are that are just in that office. Lord, what an amazing, uh, what an amazing place of power in this nation. We thank you for our country. We thank you for the House, uh, Lord, with its members. We thank you for those who have um, attempted to serve and to to speak truth and stand up for righteousness. Lord, I pray you'll give them uh, courage and continue to do so. We do pray for the Speaker of the House and all that uh, she's going through right now with her husband. Lord, we don't know all the details. It doesn't sound completely transparent in the news about what's happening. And while we have our suspicions, Lord, it's not for us to decide right now. I pray that you would uh, bring justice to that situation. Um, and as uh, we need to, Lord, we do pray for the salvation of those involved. We see such evil, and yet, Lord, the thief on the cross um, had a chance to repent and be saved, and he was. And so we thank you for that conversion, and uh, Lord, that your your patience and your grace to all of us and uh, to those in the house. Um, Lord, we pray for our representatives. We pray that uh, you would draw them into contact with folks who would be in a position to share the truth of the gospel with them. We pray that uh, they would be saved, they, they would accept the truth of your gospel, they would uh, recognize the power of the gospel, the power of the word of God, and that they would become principled and principal leaders of our nation. We pray for the election cycle, or we need to do struggle with these conundrums of candidates who, who may hide certain characteristics and uh, Lord, maybe even deceive us uh, where we think that they're a, a good candidate. Help us to be wise. Help us to vote with our conscience. Help us to vote. Help us to be an encouragement to others who may be wavering. You've given us a voice in this culture. Help us to use it uh, in this way. But we do pray for our house. And we pray that uh, your will be done, Lord, in this election cycle. And that uh, folks would, would come to know you and that you would glorify you. Uh, regardless of the results, we would continue to pray for those in authority in Jesus' name. Yeah, Heavenly Father, we do <clears throat> thank you for this passage here in First Timothy that reminds us of our need to be praying, acknowledge our failure to do so, 
to be able to live the way not pay enough. It's sort of part of the reason why we're going to ask for it. Or just pray that you would uh, just continue to work in the hearts, in our hearts, that we have a desire to see people transformed by the power of the gospel. Not just limited to neighbors and friends, but even those that we would consider our enemies to just work in their hearts. It's never too late until they take their last breath. You know, all the evil that even President Biden has done over the years with his working the nomination of the Supreme Court that caused all the UA to continue on for decades now. Good it's his responsibility, Lord, and we realize that he continues with his march of promoting death to life. Pray that you would touch his heart as he's older than us. He's on the uh, step, we're stepping to eternity, Lord. And you have the power to touch his heart and to help him to realize that he's here right with you and that's the most important thing that he can do. I think of Carolyn Harris and her, her background is so supporting all the ungodly causes Lord, that are out there. We just again pray that you would work in her life. You would bring people across her path and clear testimony of love for Christ, but also love for, for her, her soul, not just be political opponents. Just try to tear people down. We just pray that you would work there that we'll see great saving. Pray for Chuck Schumer, who is so instrumental in the Senate to push through some of this wicked legislation. Again, work there, change his heart. Down the list, think on the other side of the aisle as well. I don't know how many of them are truly safe. Mitch McConnell, is, is he a believer? If not, Lord, pray that even if he has some policies that we agree with, Lord, pray especially that he would be right with him, that he would seek your word for counsel as he yes. tries to lead in the economy. Just uh, pray for this election. There's been a lot of um, choices, a lot of close races. Just again, even the, sometimes the choices we've had, we've been frustrated that none of them seem to be really what we need or we want. And we just pray that you would, <clears throat> again, just oversee the entire process that we have a fair outcome that we have those people really be put into office that would uh, desire what's best for this country and what's best for what, what you would desire for this country as well. We see that this kind of election in each of these areas. This is something I've been thinking on. Um, Christians' response and attitude toward the government, what shapes um, the way we do it? You as a person. Who's your mentor and your attitude and your thoughts towards political leaders? And my fear is, is that we have a conservative media and there's some good things they're doing, exposing things, but they're not on the most part, believers. So their manner and how they communicate may be different than what the Bible says. And yet they have a large part in a lot of conservative Christians' lives. And they see these mentors in the media who understand a one-state country. And they get it. You know, so media sources, they understand where it's going politically. But I, I wanted to share with you, they don't understand the Bible on the most part. And they do not have, they don't understand the next step is is the crushing of true believers. That's where this is going, okay? Let me illustrate what I'm saying. So a lot of our people are, are Fox News, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, just saying if you're on a steady diet of Fox News, you're watching five different people on, on a nightly basis. And uh, they're exposing the issues. Praise the Lord. Someone's doing it. Someone's reporting on the news, right, from a conservative perspective. But their spiritual background, just so you understand where the issue coming from. So just walk through that a little bit. Brett Bayer. Um, Brett, raised Catholic, attended a private Roman Catholic high school in Atlanta, Georgia. Very Catholic. Okay. 
Great thing. And that doesn't mean he's a bad guy. I'm just saying that theologically, um, he, he's probably not talking about dispensationalism. Okay. So um, he knows some, some catechism stuff, whatever, whatever. Jesse Waters, young brother, very outspoken, exposing a lot of stuff, good, good, a lot of good things you may hear in uh, reporting. Life. Okay, so Jesse um, uh, has some Jewish background, uh, not practicing, he was not a practicing Jew. Um, he marries Noel Inguwagagiyato, how <laughs> you would say this name, in 2009, a Catholic. Jesse, um, she files for divorce when, when he's having an affair with his director. So Jesse gets a divorce, marries another Catholic, Emma D. Giovanni. They marry in 2019. Jesse does pretty well, makes about $16 million a year. Uh, he attended the William Penn Charter School. Uh, his current wife attended the oldest Catholic uh, school in, in New Jersey. Uh, very prestigious school, the Academy of St. Elizabeth and Morris now. Very many of these areas, not the schools. Uh, they just had a baby of their own, and that baby was baptized in the Catholic Church. Okay, just whatever. Um, you, you come to Tucker. Uh, he's married to Susan Andrews. Her dad was a, 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 an Episcopal pastor and a, a, a headmaster for St. George's School. Uh, he's going to meet her in school. Uh, Episcopalian background, both of them. He attends Trinity College. Um, he loves the Episcopal Church. <clears throat> loves the Episcopal Church. He's been challenged. Your political views are conservative. Your theological association is just the opposite and largely in opposition to what you say on TV. He says, he says here's, his own, here's his words. I'm a shallow guy. <laughs> when he was challenged with his obvious inconsistency there, I'm a shallow guy. That's why I still go to the Episcopal Church. That's what he says. He says, I like it. I like the liturgy. I like it. I'm not changing. I get it. I, I get the inconsistency. I'm just shallow. So let's move on. Next question. So Episcopal, he just recently said he's not born again. He just made a very good not born again. I'm not opposed to people born again, but some not born again. Very strong, strong Episcopal. Sean Hannity, bless his heart, but like Hannity, you have to be Catholic. So he was Catholic as we grew up. So recent years, and he, he's disenfranchised. He, get, he gets sick of the politics of the Catholic Church. He said it was too much institutionalized corruption. So he left it. For what? He's, he's floundering. Poor guy, he's... Just flouting you heard from his favorite Bible verse, you may know it. What is it? John 14. Yeah, I'm not your heart be troubled. Okay, all right. So, um, but he's struggling. The guy's gone for another marriage issue. Just the, the guy's struggling. Uh, he does oppose the mosque that's going to be built by the World Trade Center. He came up very, very strong against that. When it comes to the Quran, he says, This is like Mein Kampf. Okay, this is a, most, this is a Hitler Bible. So he, he's taking a pretty good stand against Islam. Laura Ingram. Got to like quote Laura. She was a Baptist until age 12. And then she got converted to Roman Catholicism. Oh. So Roman Catholic. Um, she adopted a Guatemalan girl, Catholic. She was engaged to Dinesh D'Souza. Some of you may not know that. So she was very fond of Dinesh. That didn't work out. Didn't work out. She's gone for breast cancer, a lot of challenges. Very strong. Very, very strong. Gutfeld. Raised the Catholic. He's an altar boy. Today, you ask uh, Gutfeld, what, what is your theology? He says, I am an agnostic atheist. Right. So all I'm trying to say here, that this is just one conservative, you know, franchise, Catholic franchise here. And they may be seeing some things politically, but I don't think you should probably get your theological and practical Christian living from these guys. Okay? So I'm going to read what the Bible says about government. And whoever you compare these verses to, it doesn't matter. This is what you and I need to do. Right? So I'll just end on this and pray for our current leadership. I summarize 11 points. When I go to all the New Testament passages, the dominant one is you'd be submissive, subject to the higher authorities. Secondly, do good to your authorities. These are commands by Paul and by Peter. Be respectful of your authorities. Be afraid. Be respectful of your authorities. 
Render, another command, dues, tribute, custom, fear, honor to your authorities. We just read supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for your people in authority. Lesser authorities, obey the magistrates. Number seven, be prepared to do good works for your authorities. Speak evil of no authority. Speak evil of no authority. Just let that sing. That's a command. And that's that's when Nero is running the government. Don't speak evil of Nero. And I, I know what the verb is. And I think it relates to speaking evil, speaking slanderously, misrepresenting, harassing. I get it. Be not hostile toward an authority. So whatever your manner is, you, as a Christian, you're not going to be hostile to an authority. But it says, in contrast, be gentle and kind to authorities. Number 11, demonstrate meekness. You have all this energy and power. And you have to you have understand the issues. And you have all this force. Keep it under control. Demonstrate meekness towards your authorities. There's one more command where, where it says, keep reminding believers to keep these commands. So I look at that list, and that needs to be my life. And man, when I studied this, it was convicting. It was convicting. Okay. I'm not praying the way I should for authorities. I'm speaking evil of authorities. I'm not trying to be truthful, always. But I don't say sometimes the nicest of things. Okay. Uh, I know it doesn't bother you. That's the problem, John. <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> okay. So what's happening is the media can't be your example. On this. They're, they're going to they're gonna harangue, man. And then you have Christians out there who, who are wimpy, which I don't want to be a wimpy, passive, yucky, wimpy, useless Christian. So now we want to cheer on these, these guys who are in the face, hostile, and Christians who are standing up like an Old Testament prophet like Elijah and going off the, beyond Elijah, going off on these tangents. And we're all cheering these guys on. I'm saying, is that guy doing good? Is he showing respect? Is he speaking properly? Is he showing gentleness and kindness? I'll say it. So... If I can just end tonight, someone has got to mentor, someone has got to embody these truths of what the Christian should look like in view of government. And when I put those combinations together, I think that's a winning combination win people. I really do. I think that I want to be treated this way. I want to be respectful. I want to be treated kindly. I want people to be respectful when they have a conversation. So very, very, very powerful. This is the New Testament teaching that Christians in the church age how to respond to our governments. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I know it's biblical. But in light of that, <laughs> should there be a United States of America? Because we hold our founding forefathers up. They, look what they do. That's a huge question that is very difficult. And obviously, answer. somehow, the Lord will allow it. You also you hear what Sam is saying. If, if you follow this to whatever, let's say submission to authorities, you don't rebel. Right, and, and that, that, that is where all the ink was shed with those pastures as they wrestled with that question: Are we are we pleasing God if we make this break? And that was the issue. And some guys said no, we can't do it. Other guys said yes. And I, we'll come back to that. But that's that's the million dollar question. I mean, it, from from an American, from I mean, America. For me, you know, your approach is is the way to go. I mean. It seems to me the Lord, even Peter, when he took the year off of the, you know, the Lord said, hey, put your sword away. You know, you're not to use weapons, you're not to use a sword. But we do have this sword, and it's sharply meant to be that sword. And so that's what he's about. Well, and you're this, doing this is our sword. It is our sword. Weapons of, uh, of our warfare are not carnal. We have spiritual weapons, he is this is a very complicated topic because our flesh I would love to get up in the pulpit and if, if you want me to rant and rave and run every single guy down and blast away I can get a lot of amens and that could feed my pride even I might want to do it again right and I'll tell you what the Romans when, 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 when Christianity was moving forward these macho Roman soldiers are saying you Christians I mean Meekness? Who cares about meekness? That's not a that's not a good characteristic. Be meek, have strength under control. Let's see your strength. People want your own, you know. But these are qualities of Christ, and I'm glad you know he was meek.
imagine if he wasn't. Wow, where would we be? It seems like we have a choice to be spiritual and we have a choice to be cultural. But what I'm trying to say here, just to end on, is this is what we want to emulate those verses. And I'm looking out there at pastors, and I know the good guys who are doing it. Please don't you know. You're looking, if you're looking at the media to be your example on how to talk about government, I think you better be very careful. Because they're going to feed your flesh. Okay? They're going to feed your flesh. And it's not that it doesn't line up. It doesn't line up. Now, I want to be informed. I'm going to be informed. I don't think we know all these things, what's going on. But I, I don't want to <clears throat> emulate the, uh, and I, I heard for these conservative politicians political you know, media people. They're brilliant. They're well-researched. They understand the one-state problem. They have a lot of the political views that are, you know, you know, I'm saying, how can you be so blind? Some of them will say that the source of these the authority comes from God. Some will say that. Probably all that list. Is in but they don't realize that that authority is coming from God and it should drive us to our knees to worship that God. Okay? And to be in his word and to walk with him and to love him. And there's this total disconnect. They're not going to be able to tell you about what's coming next with Antichrist and false prophet. They, they don't have that. They don't have the tools to tell you that. But it's interesting. You'll see there are a few born-again people in, a, in, in their circles. Watch them interact. Okay? Here's a Dan Bongino. Have any of you heard his testimony? <clears throat> Bongino. Bongino. Can you imagine the testimony of a Bongino? And um, occasionally he'll say, you know, I'm born again. I'm a Christian, and I got some problems. My mouth is my problem. I have a bad mouth. Okay. And he does. Okay. But he knows it. Now I want to change it. You know, but at least he says it. He says, look, I'm, I come from a rough background, and, you know, and I talk, talk trash, and I, I know I say the wrong thing, but I'm a Christian. Shame on me. You know? Okay, I can, I can prepare a little bit of God. It's honest. You know, kind of thing. But watch the dynamics of the Christians. When I, when I was playing baseball in college, one of the funniest stories was when my coach gave me the ball to pitch against Liberty University in a, in a, in a tournament. And I said to Coach Rice, Coach, I'm gonna, I think we, we had Ohio State in three or four pretty, pretty large schools. And I get Liberty. I'm the ace. Believe me, I'm the ace. And I get Liberty. I said, Coach, I don't want to pitch against Liberty. I want to pitch the next game. You know? He says, oh, you're going to pitch against Liberty. So I, I pitch against Liberty, and I never get out of the first inning. And, and the fourth batter is Sid Bream. I don't know if any of you guys know Sid Bream. Famous for the slide, World Series victory. And uh, Sid drilled a ball, almost took everyone's head off. He just whistled by everybody. It was rocket. And after the game, uh, I only made it one inning, not even one. And uh, those guys came after us to witness to us. And those guys, they were, they were very aggressive. But hopefully they're still up. They were very aggressive. So Sid has a sister, and she's a, she is a media girl. What's her name? Shannon. Shannon Green. That's her, that's her that's his sister. She's born again. She's a Liberty fan. She's born again. Watch how these people, watch how the unsaved walk around some of these true born-again people. It's very fascinating. There's a respect, but there's also, they want to bring them down. They're always trying to pull them down. I'm going to trip them up a little bit. You're too goody-goody, you know. So there are some people there that understand not only the one state problem, but where it's going beyond that, that have the tools, the Bible in their hand. And uh, I admire those kind of people. That's illustrated between Chris and Trump's relationship with Mike Pence. Yeah. It's very much the same. Yeah. And I'm encouraged when you, you get political guys. Here's Manasseh who gets saved. I, I, I lean on that. Let's follow these biblical truths. Let's pray for these people. We might get a Manasseh saved, or, or a Nebuchadnezzar saved, or or whoever saved. You know. So, I want to close in prayer. And um, brother, Bob, would you pray for our president? Yes. And our vice president, and my four pictures, our speaker of the house, and for our governor. Would please.